time to start. Okay, good. Should I start? Yes. Or our first speaker is Daniel Hauer, and he will talk about the fundamental gap conjecture. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor Kozlov, and thank you, the organizing committee, for inviting me uh, to this wonderful conference in this difficult period. It's really a, uh, a great honor for me that uh, I got invited to give a talk about this beautiful conjecture. So, um, one second. The talk is based basically on those two papers which appeared in Cambridge Journal of Mathematics and in the Proceeding of the American Mathematical Society. And you can find either them in the internet or on my webpage. I will, unfortunately, in these 20 minutes, I'm not able to uh, show you a lot of the proofs, but I think I can give you at least a good idea, an overview about the whole problem and what we achieved so far. So this is a joint work with my Australian colleagues, Ben Andrews and uh, Julie Kladerbach. And uh, so we are working on this project already for quite a while. And uh, let's start with the fundamental gap conjecture. So in, in his paper, in his study on the Bose-Einstein condensation, Professor Michael Vandenberg uh, stated in his paper from 1983, the following conjecture. So omega is a convex domain in RDE, and V is a convex potential. And then the, he, he conjectured that the difference between the first and the second Dirichlet eigenvalue or eigenvalue of the Dirichlet Schrodinger operator satisfies this kind of estimate. So the Schrodinger operator is equipped with a homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition. And the D here, this is the diameter of uh, the convex domain omega. So this difference is uh, a, a very special uh, quantity and that's called the fundamental gap or also called the spectral gap. And it appears in particular in quantum physics uh, when you study the motion of an electron in an electric field generated uh, by a nucleus with exactly one proton. And uh, when uh, the electron changes the energy levels, there comes, uh, it emits energy and that's a photon. And uh, exactly so the, the maximal energy is measured by the difference of the two eigenstates, E1 and E2. And you see here, that's the eigenvalue equation basically of the Schrodinger operator. And so this difference is then called the fundamental gap. The fundamental gap appears in, in many, uh, many problems, not only in, in uh, uh, quantum physics, but of course also, for instance, in, uh, in quantum, quantum physics or quantum computing uh, in numerical methods to compute large eigenvalue problems. And now, and also in asymptotic behavior, I, I, I missed this point to say. So, uh, and so when you look for the dimensional dimension D equals one case, and when you take the, the potential to be the zero potential, then we have the classical one, uh, one dimensional eigenvalue equation or second order ODE. And we can compute, of course, the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues explicitly. And so we see then that the second and the first eigenvalue is exactly three pi square on D square. Yeah, so provided that omega is the interval from minus d on two to d on two. So you see that basically you get a sharp bound of in higher dimension of the fundamental gap. It must be bounded from below by the fundamental gap, gap of the zero potential in dimension one. Okay, so the fundamental gap, gap, fundamental gap conjecture was also independent suggested by Ashbo and Ben Guria in 1989, and uh, by Professor Yao in 1986. But they all did not prove it. They they contributed, but they could not establish the conjecture. Ashbo and Ben Guria proved the fundamental gap in dimension one when the potential v is symmetric and single well, and uh, v is decreasing 
on the interval from zero is non-decreasing on the interval zero to d on two. Horvath partially improved the above symmetry assumption by allowing single well potentials v with a minimum at x equals zero. And uh, uh, Lavin, Richard Lavin, he proved then finally the fundamental gap conjecture for general convex uh, potential in dimension d equals one for homogeneous theoretically boundary condition. <coughs> in, high, in higher dimensions, Banuelos, Mendes, Hernandez, they proved the fundamental gap conjecture only when V is uh, for the zero potential. And Davis and Banuelos and Kroger, they proved it in dimension two when omega is symmetric. So they use the reduction of dimension argument and uh, uh, that's where the symmetry is used, or the symmetry of the domain. Then non-optimal bounds were established using Hanak inequalities by Singer, Wong, Yao, and Yao in 1985. So you see this is the non-optimal bound. And this was slightly improved by Yu and Zong with pi square and d square. So it took them quite a while until 2011 until my collaborators, Ben Andrews and Julie Kladerbach finally proved the fundamental gap conjecture for general convex potentials for homogeneous directly boundary conditions. So now the first problem is, does the fundamental gap conjecture also hold for other boundary conditions? So that's a natural question which arises, why only homogeneous directly boundary conditions? and uh, what kind of boundary conditions we were looking at. So here we have, again, the eigenvalue problem. And now you see for the Schrodinger operator, and now you see here mixed boundary condition, so we, which we also called Robin boundary condition. So alpha is a Robin coefficient. And nu, this is the outward pointing unit normal. So nu, uh, d nu, phi alpha is a normal derivative. So then when alpha is zero, we come to homogeneous Neumann boundary condition. And when we divide by alpha, no negative or st yes, strictly positive, and let alpha tend to infinity, we recover from Robin actually Dirichlet boundary condition. And that's the reason why I call alpha equals plus infinity, I call this the Dirichlet case. So the eigenvalues for Neumann, Rubin, and Dirichlet, they have the beautiful monotonicity condition that when alpha increases, the eigenvalue for all alpha, they increase. So here you have the, uh, uh, the uh, Neumann eigenvalue, this then it is, and on the other extreme, you have the Dirichlet eigenvalue, and in the middle, you have the Rubin eigenvalue. So what kind of first results did we obtain in this direction? We obtain, unfortunately, non-optimal bounds. So when V is a, um, an L1 function, which is bounded from below, this is a condition just which you need when uh, um, that you are sure that you have a discrete spectrum of the Schrodinger operator. Then, and let lambda alpha 1V and lambda alpha 2V be the first and second Robin eigenvalues of the Schrodinger operator. And then if you can show that the first eigenfunction yeah, is log concave, so with Robin boundary, then the fundamental gap is larger or equal than pi square on d square. Okay. So this holds for any alpha. Okay, and let me say that when you have alpha equals zero, then we are in the Neumann case. And uh, in the Neumann case, the first eigenfunction is just constant one. And so you get actually, when V is zero, when V is the, is the zero potential. And so we recover basically an optimal bound because this is the pain wine barrier inequality. So then this bound becomes sharp. So we had a new proof of the pain wine barrier inequality, but 
which we were as a byproduct, but we were actually more interested in proving the fundamental gap conjecture in general for general convex potentials. The proof is nice and it's not very long, but as I said, I cannot give it here, but rather let's focus on a second interesting problem. This first statement says now it relates and asks, is for any given convex potential V, the first Robin eigenfunction log concave? in order to obtain first lower uh, uh, lower bounds on the spectral bound, on the spectral gap. And so what we did is, which is natural, you look for, uh, for special cases first before you start proving the theory. So when you look in the rectangle, and this is easy, you know that if phi alpha is the first eigenfunction on the interval from zero to A, and phi alpha hat is the eigenfunction on the interval from zero to B, then the product of them provides you with an eigenfunction on the rectangle. And on each interval, the first eigenfunction is log concave and log concave, uh, uh, the logarithm actually applied to the product just carries on. So it's the product is actually again log concave. So yes, on the rectangle, it's, it's fair, it's true. So on the ball, we have symmetry. And when we look for the eigenvalue problem, just for the zero potential case, then uh, um, it reduces actually to a second order ODE. And then by using the shooting method, you can again show that phi alpha is, is even concave. Concave implies log concave. So in both extreme cases, the ball is a smooth convex domain. The rectangle is a Lipschitz convex domain. It's another extreme. So one could actually guess it's natural to, to think this could always be the case. So the first Robin eigenfunction is a log concave function. But you see the sky becomes dark and uh, it's actually false. And to tell you the truth, we were one, we were actually working the first year in the wrong direction. We were believing it is true until we arrived to a contradiction in our proof that this cannot be true. And so we had to attack the whole problem from the different side. And that's the result which we got. So when omega is a convex poly polyhedral domain, which is not a product of circumsolids, and I will explain what this means in a, in a shortly, then for sufficiently small alpha, so alpha is the Robin parameter in the boundary condition, the first Robin eigenfunction, so not of the Schrodinger operator, it's the, uh, the Robin eigenfunction of the Laplacian with Robin eigen uh, uh, boundary condition is not log concave, okay? So, so it becomes quite geometrically the condition basically. So what is uh, a convex polyhedron? I think everyone knows this. And, and convex polyhedron is an open bounded set, which can be rewritten as a finite uh, number of intersections of hyperplanes, which you see here in the scroll, uh, curl brackets. B1, nu m are the unit vectors and B1, vm are just constants. And now a convex polyhedral domain is called a circumsolid. If you can put a, a ball, so X naught is the center of the ball and each face of the given domain touches the ball exactly at one point. So here you see in R2, every rectangle, actually, every triangle is, is uh, a circumsolid. Also the regular pentagon or the squee quadrilateral or the skew triangle are, are uh, circumsolids. But for instance, the quadrilaterals of this form is not a circumsolid because this circle, this side does not touch this inner sphere. And in higher dimension, we have, for instance, the regular tetrahedron, it's a circumsolid, or the regular dodecahedron is also a circumsolid. 
The tetrahedron is a flat tip. So you cut off the tetrahedron at the top. It's not a circumsolid because only if the upper plane will be going down, you move it down and it touches the inter inner sphere. So now what is the product of circumsolids? A product of, uh, you call a convex polyhedral domain, a product of circumsolids, if you can decompose it, basically. So there is a finite number of, uh, of orthogonal subspaces. So you can decompose RD in a finite number of orthogonal subspaces. And there are circumsolids, omega one, omega k, which are in EI such that omega can be rewritten basically as a projection on these orthogonal subspaces that they are in omega i. So let's give me you some examples. Obviously the rectangle is not a circumsolid as the quadrilateral in general is not a circumsolid because the inner sphere will not touch this side. But it's a product of circumsolid because you can decompose R2 in two orthogonal spaces. And then you have omega one is the interval from, from zero A. And this is the interval from zero B. So this is omega two. And the projection on each R will provide basically that omega restricted, uh, projected on those subspaces is a circumsolid. So the rectangle is a product of circumsolid. And also in higher dimension, the higher dimensional rectangle is a product of circumsolid. And here you see in R3, a prism over a regular pentagon, it's also a product of circumsolids. Yeah, because you can decompose R3 and R2 times R. And then of course, here you have a regular pentagon, which is in R2, a circumsolid. And then you have still this line, this interval, which is also a circumsolid. So coming back, if omega is a convex polyhedron, which is not a product of circumsolids, on such domains, we can show that for sufficiently small alpha, the first row bound eigenfunction phi alpha is not long concave. Now one could think of that this basically, the smoothness of the domain is very crucial, but actually it is not. So here you have Lipschitz and you need to obey this circumsolids result, but that is not true. You can actually approximate such a, a convex polyhedral domain with smooth domains, which are not any more polyhedrals in the, with respect to the Hausdorff distance. And then you can, because converging in the Hausdorff distance, approximating omega with respect to the Hausdorff distance implies locally uniform conversion of the eigenfunction. And then since you have uh, an inverse inequality in the log concavity, you provide, you can generalize this result. So here, non-log concavity means you get, you find at least two points in omega and in T naught such that this strict inequality holds. And then by the Hausdorff conversion, which implies local uniform conversions, you get that if omega naught, it's a reference domain, it's a convex polyhedral domain, which is not the product of circumlund solids, then for sufficiently small alpha and for any convex domain omega, which is sufficiently close on omega naught with respect to the Hausdorff topology, the first row bound eigenfunction is not log concave. And now, of course, it's interesting to see what happens at the other extreme when alpha tends to infinity, you recover the robot eigenfunctions converge to the Dirichlet eigenfunction. And um, so recently by Grazio Krasta and Ilaria Fragala, they proved exactly, they proved the existence of such a threshold. So when omega is open and uniformly convex and the boundary needs to be sufficiently smooth, then exists such a threshold of alpha of the Robin parameter such that for all alpha larger than this threshold, the Robin eigenfunction of the negative Laplace operator is strictly log concave. 
So we are on the left extreme and they proved exactly the opposite. I think this is very nice. So they completed the picture. So uh, we, now- You have one yes. minute. One minute, thanks. So the, then now it is actually the natural question whether one can prove the fundamental gap conjecture with Rubin boundary condition without using log concavity. And the answer is yes, in dimension one, you can do it. And, and we did it, yeah. So we did it not only for single well, we did it also, let me go, we did it also for general convex potentials. So we proved that the fundamental gap conjecture holds in dimension one. And thank you for your, for listening. Yes, thank you. Uh, questions? Excuse me? Uh, no, no, uh, it's uh, time for questions, possibly. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, please. For, not for you, but for others who is uh, around, for around. But I, I wonder then, uh, the potential V, sometimes uh, yes. you put some restrictions on V. So yes. everything is proved for general V, or there are some restrictions on V. Yeah, the so the general result is when V is a convex potential, mm -hmm. yeah, only then, so we need the convexity of the potential in order to get sharp bounds, lower bounds on the fundamental gap. Okay. Uh, Daniel, uh, I have a question. Uh, the first uh, result uh, for the Dirichlet case in 1D, uh, it is also it also holds uh, uh, no, for uh, more, not more general, but uh, for other classes uh, uh, of V. Uh, uh, not necessarily uh, convex, uh, the, uh, the first result. Uh, so you, uh, is this a question or you, it's a comment? No, it, it, no, it, it is not a question. Uh, are there uh, some uh, uh, more conjectures maybe about uh, other classes of V? Yes, so, so there are no conjectures. Uh, but uh, there are results uh, also on lower bounds, but they are all non-optimal. And uh, so there are results. So when you look, for instance, there is the Asia Pacific Analysis and PD Seminar, there's a website, you will find the speaker who just spoke about this recently, also on this. So they want just not convex potentials, they want a C infinity potential, which have a small bump. And this immediately has an impact an impact on the fundamental gap, but mm -hmm. they all get non-optimal bounds. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, well, we are interested in establishing, uh, having different boundary conditions and we keep the convexity. But of course, another step is to look what happens if we weaken the condition of convexity, if we can go away and get the more general class. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.